So I, I did. I wanted to thank Daniel not just for uh, for the uh, work uh, that he did for organizing the conference, which is a little more than me. Uh, it pays to be. It's another way non-locality pays because it's the local organizer. <coughs> and also, I thank Daniel because uh, he got me started about this uh, sort of connection, um, theoretical quantum error correction and uh, actual experiment. So. Uh, That's the memo. So, so I'll, I'll, hopefully he'll remember at some point. <coughs> so I'll apologize for this little introduction in advance. I have this uh, whatever it is. <coughs> and so I couldn't sleep last night because I was coughing. So I looked around on Google Images and I found some uh, some images. Sorry, you'll have to you'll have to sort of twist your hips around a little bit. So there were some uh, options for the uh, for the title of the. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, there were some some options for the title of the uh, of the panel. So there's uh, well, one idea was theory meet. That's kind of a nice nice version of it. <laughs> So I found this one. Google Images is kind of not good for me to play with. It's say 2 a.m. in the morning. And I have no idea what it was in my time. Um, <clears throat> then there's the, maybe I thought, okay, well, I, 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 this is one of the uh, possible ones. Theorists versus experimentalists. <coughs> Pardon me. Well, okay, that's the opposite extreme. Maybe we don't want to go that far. And then I thought, well, there's a between theory and experiment. Well, what is a good image for that? Well, I thought maybe <coughs> I felt like this a few times. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but that wasn't exactly the idea either. Um, so I found this other brick wall that has a hole in it. And I thought that was a bit more appropriate. There is a bit of a wall or a barrier or a gap of some sort theory and experiment authors. And, uh, you know, at least this one there can have a connection. You can have a connection uh, through the hole in the wall. And maybe if we, uh, you know, talk a little bit today and, uh, and uh, maybe we can take a brick out. So, so this is the original introduction. There was the... Uh, Title. Well, still an imperfect title, but that's okay. Uh, not optimal, I'd say. So, uh, so there was a past theme which I didn't really want to consider. I hope, hope the panelists don't want to consider. When will a quantum computer be built? Um, so, you know, very often people talk about this. There's now, and then how long from now? 10, 15 years, whatever. So then the other day I found this in the New York Times. You probably can't see the link. But it comes up if I, I think it might come up if I click it. No, no it won't come up. If I click it. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a minute because I thought this was kind of mildly interesting. It's in the Times, so it's all the news that's fit to print, right? So. <laughs> There we go. Predicting the future of computing. Of course, I had to scroll down. And at some point, let's see, there's a. Uh, 2030. Where is it now? Oh, yes, 2033. Okay. And so I thought it's been decided, so we don't have to <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> so I thought that was great. And then I dragged this over by chance. I just thought these were dry. These were titles, right? And then by chance, they dragged the thing over. So let me scroll down, and it has more information. 
And by now, it was a little lower the other day, uh, our readers predict this will occur around 2033, having moved this date 596 times. <coughs> so then I thought, okay, well, there's not quite agreement on that, then is there? Um, so, uh, so somebody predicted by 2025, and, and then there's another thing that I was a little disappointed about. Uh, when you look at this down here, oh, okay, now it's symmetric. Actually, before you could make it earlier by four years or later by, no, earlier by three years or later by four years. And I was a little disappointed by that because of the asymmetry, right? But now it's earlier by four years. So even though they haven't, they've changed it 596 times, they still give a, a bit of a standard deviation, I guess, plus or minus four years. <coughs> so anyway, so I, These were I estimates by the readers? Pardon? These were estimates by the readers? Of the it is, yes, determined by the readers, supposedly. So anyway, that's, uh, that's okay. So I wanted to just say, let's suppose this has been answered by the New York Times. So a little more specific question, how do we get from A to B? Forget about when A is, well, A is now. Forget about when B is, but, uh, but how do we get from uh, A to B? So with that sort of idea in mind, I pose the following questions to our panelists. Well, I should say we, it was actually a collective effort. And so, I thought what we would do first. Uh, can you read that in the back, by the way? Yes, okay. Um, so I thought what we would do first is give uh, everyone a chance to, uh, to respond to these questions, uh, say three, three minutes or so. And, uh, and I'm going to, uh, we have a clock so we can time you, okay? So I won't be too strict about the time. And after they respond to these questions, then um, maybe they would have a second round of responding to uh, some of the panelists' responses, and then we'll open it up for discussion uh, by everyone. So, <coughs> you know what happens when you're late, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> we put you on the spot, and we'll let you go first. Okay. Uh, I'll answer in kind of free form without uh, trying to address numbers one, two, or three. Uh, they all capture a theme uh, for me, and they were also captured in the, in the title, which was this idea of practical uh, questions associated with quantum computing. I think it's really interesting to note that if you look back in the history of the field uh, just for the last, uh, say, 10 years, people used to worry about realizing a qubit, then they started worrying uh, kind of en masse about realizing a multi-qubit gate, and now they worry uh, not even so much about realizing algorithms still very impressive, but it's kind of something that's been demonstrated, it works, we understand it. Uh, the questions are starting to trend towards, in my, in my view, uh, engineering questions. Uh, so there's this, it's a thematic shift, and so it's not, does error correction work at a quantum level, it's can you do repeated quantum error correction and preserve a qubit for an extended time? What are the tasks and challenges that come into play there? Can you suppress errors? Uh, to the 10 to the minus 5 level for fault tolerance. I mean, these are, these are things we're seeing in experiment being, being realized. Uh, in ions, it's 2 by 10 to the minus 5, and in NMR, it's even better than that. Uh, but these things are not fundamental anymore. They're not foundational questions of, of quantum physics. They're practical questions, and so what becomes of interest to me as an experimentalist who, who has limited mathematical ability, you heard my diatribe about group theory the <laughs> other day, uh, I'm really interested in, in theoretical problems that address, or theoretical work that addresses practical problems. And I want to make very clear, I think it's really useful that we have a big division of labor in the community. I don't think it would be good if every theorist started working on the effects of timing resolution in, in, in dynamic multicoupling. I think it's great that people uh, do really deep dive into color codes and subsystem codes and all sorts of other codes that I barely understand. Uh, I think it's extremely healthy and useful. But one thing I would like to see more of is uh, some consideration of engineering aspects and making connections with community. There is uh, a, a really big body of literature that relates to uh, control theory and classical control, and we, we've seen a little bit of that uh, uh, in the talks for the last couple of days. It's nice to see, it would be nice to see that uh, rising to more prevalence, which involves uh, a growing body of theorists who have 
kind of a special capability to function in a laboratory setting. And uh, Manny was a great uh, uh, example of that. He came and would change the dye in the lab uh, for lasers. Um, so that's a little bit extreme, <laughs> but the idea that, that you can traverse both worlds is, uh, is a requirement, I think, uh, moving forward if we're going to really tackle these hard problems. And it's, it's true of the experimentalists as well. We're required to learn more and more about these, uh, these group theoretical concepts and code systems and trying to translate them into an experimental setting. But, uh, you know, I don't want to give a specific answer about exactly what problem to work on. I wanted to give this thematic answer that uh, uh, making this towards engineering-oriented problems and uh, uh, experiment meeting theory kind of in the lab level. What are the realistic constraints that your systems face? If you tell me you can do some optimal modulation that requires 19 digits of precision in, in amplitude of a pulse, that's not really useful. It's, it's important to understand what we can really do. And at least some people, uh, I, I hope, can start thinking about that in a very serious way. Thank you. Yeah, I've understood the question in a slightly different way because it says, uh, what are the particular error correction and prevention methods which are most useful for your particular experiment? So let me just uh, get a bit astray from these general remarks. I would like to come back to things that we are doing. As shown in the talk, we are using decoherence-free subspaces for error prevention. We are needed and applicable. And we use appropriate encoding qubits when necessary. <clears throat> and then, of course, we'll have to see where the trade-off is between the number of qubits and uh, the timing and uh, the, the precision that we have, the coherence time. We use the error correction for real active error correction, and here's a redundancy code, a three-qubit code. And when you're asking now uh, what's lacking and uh, how so, then at this time I would rather say we have a bunch of uh, operations available that are very complex. <coughs> and very powerful, and I don't have an idea how they can possibly be used for further, deeper, more complex error correction, and maybe that's something that could be addressed by theorists. And uh, <clears throat> the quantum error correction protocols to overcome correlated noise are relatively new to me. I've heard now some comments after my talk and have been given good advice. I'd be grateful for even more interested in collaborating on this because this is something that really prevents us from doing uh, better error correction at this time and getting further. And then, of course, uh, the general question is, we have a number of problems. I don't have the time here, but if you're really interested, I can point, uh, pinpoint all these numbers down for you. Where we have technical shortcomings. For each individual technical point, there is possibly a solution for decoherence-free subspace. Now, one encoding is probably not optimal for another uh, uh, noise source. So the, the question is then, what would be an optimal choice for decoherence-free subspace? This is probably, again, depending on the implementation. And here, again, the advice of theorists would be really uh, very welcome. And uh, again, all our results currently rely on the availability of what we, I, I call a quantum compiler which uh, really translates the circuitry that theorists like that we can, uh, can uh, uh, write down and uh, which translate that to the pulse sequence that's underlying. And of course, this is now by now sort of an optimizing compiler. When I approach theorists, and I've talked to several people here already too, when I approach theorists whether they would be interested in doing this, uh, many theorists simply told me, oh, this is not a theoretical problem, this is an engineering problem. But engineers cannot deal with this. We need physicists to do that. Uh, I would be really interested if somebody would tackle that problem because we need something that optimizes our pulses in not in the deep way like quantum uh, control, but more adapted to the experiments at hand. So this is, in short, what I think would make things much more useful for experimental, uh, experimental implementation. Okay, I think I'll try to go through the questions one by one. Uh, first question was, what <coughs> strategies are you currently using? And uh, well, I mean, I'm not sure if I know all of them, but we're trying to use uh, very different ones anyway. I mean, we've used uh, decoherence free subspaces in the past. Uh, we definitely use most of dynamic or 
in all the systems that we have, we operate very different systems, nuclear spins, electron spins, uh, optical systems. In all of them, we use in some way dynamical decoupling that for us has proved to be, has been most useful because it's relatively simple to implement, has little overhead and it works very well. I mean, we've had improvements by orders of magnitude in coherence time and we could operate it on single spins, we could operate it on uh, systems with 7,000 qubits, and it always worked. <coughs> uh, we also do error correction, but that's a lot harder, and we haven't been able to do it in all the systems that we operate. Okay, I think that was about question A. Question B, what particular experimental constraints do we have not been adequately addressed? Well, I would say none of them. <laughs> uh, at least if they were uh, adequately addressed, then we would have not 2033, uh, but we would have 2011 for the operation of a quantum computer. Also, I'm not so sure whether that's a well-posed question. I mean, we've had quantum computers for what, 14 years now in some way, but maybe not the ones which uh, are commercially viable. Also, although I claim that uh, NMR spectrometer is a commercial quantum computer, but maybe that's a different issue. Uh, particular constraints that most met, well, <coughs> uh, many. Uh, in a way, though it's sometimes a bit frustrating for us as an experimentalist, I guess you probably agree when we see theoretical curves where they show us how to reach 10 to the minus 100 fidelity, uh, deviation from unit fidelity while we are struggling to achieve 99% fidelity. Uh, but obviously there's a big gap there between experimental capabilities and theoretical uh, predictions. Uh, okay, I think I should come to see what particular wish list an experimentalist. Uh, I would actually join the two previous speakers that most of the requirements to make experimental life more easier are on the engineering side. Uh, I mean, if we had a possibility for, say, engineering or nanostructuring or nanofabrication, if we had, for instance, the ability to place diamond and V centers on a nanometer scale, we would get a long way towards a useful quantum computer. Uh, obviously, with the existing material, we could still do better, and we will do better in the, in the future, I'm, I'm very sure about that, but uh, so far, my impression is that the theorists provide us much more possible ways to do it than we can implement. Um, so about D, what... <laughs> What project would I set up for theorists, essentially? Well, uh, can I answer that in a slightly different way? Because I don't like to tell sure. the theorists what they have to do. Uh, but sure. I mean, I, but I've worked with theorists, and I've been dragged into quantum computing. Several theorists, one sitting right here, the other sitting across, and uh, some others also. So I like to work with them, and what I could perhaps put in, in that context is how it becomes easier uh, to collaborate and how uh, such a collaboration be can become more fruitful. And for those of you who uh, listened to Kaveh's talk, that was an excellent example for me, how a theorist can help an experimentalist. I mean, he stated at the beginning what his goal is, what he wants to achieve, and he described it in a way which is in principle possible to implement. I mean, he, he says, I want to uh, preserve the coherence for as long as possible, for instance. That's one possible goal, and that's something that we as experimentalists usually want to do. So there is clear clarity. And uh, the other thing is that very often uh, the Say so the goal of a theoretical work is incompatible with experimental implementation. 
Like if you show that you can decouple to infinite orders, that's great. But you need infinite resources for that. And we don't have those available. So uh, obviously we have to find some common ground there where we uh, may not be interested in implementing the highest order, but as for instance Kave showed the longest possible lifetime. So I think it, that requires uh, willingness on both sides to learn each other's language and find some common ground. So, but yeah, as a general uh, guidelines, infinities, and <laughs> and take into account that experiments are not perfect. Like the arrows. Sorry? At the beginning, the arrows at the beginning. Oh. 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 <laughs> I had two arrows um, up here, one pointing to oh, experimentalists and the other one pointing to me. I can back up. <laughs> this one. Oh, okay. There you see this one. This one I drew by hand. Well, uh, I think I echo Dieter's sentiments that uh, this field has allowed us to cross boundaries and, and collaborate with all sorts of experimentalists, uh, theorists, computer scientists, mathematicians. Uh, so uh, it's it's sort of uh, okay. There was a universal translator on 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 that uh, website, but it's quantum information seems sort of a universal translator. It's breaking down all sorts of barriers. Uh, but getting back to the, the question, uh, I, I'd really like to see someone keep a qubit alive for, for days and, and days, like uh, Reiner was talking about today. And uh, one of the exciting things that, I'm a theorist, obviously, uh, <clears throat> it has been this development of this circuit QED that has allowed all sorts of textbook experiments to happen when before it was very hard. So that's allowed all sorts of theorists to do all sorts of exciting things. and. And I think that'll just blossom and continue. So, so that's great stuff to see that. Um, and uh, okay, when I gave my talk, I, I talked about this coherent recovery, and that's when you actually don't boost the syndromes back out to the classical world and then fix your quantum computer that way. And you, it's interesting to notice that all the experiments that have been done now have done that. So, uh, I think it takes just too much effort, time, and resources to try and boost that up to the classical world. And so it'd be great to see more work on trying to look at more fault-tolerant schemes that have this coherent recovery. Um, and I noticed uh, in Reiner's talk, there were these Molmer Sorensen gates, which are these global gates that uh, entangle whole banks of ions. And again, OK, I banged on at that in my talk as well. I think that really helped save lots of resources by having access to these global uh, global addressing technologies that, that we're able to. I'm not sure, Reiner, you'd be able to do without that. No, no, not, not at all. No. So uh, again, I think this global, OK, I've pushed that uh, to, to <coughs> quite, quite an extent in the work that I've done. But I think it's actually quite useful to be able to do that, not just individual addressing, but uh, some global addressing. And these correlated errors that uh, people, people are finding, I think they're, they're going to come up quite well. And, um, but I was very excited to see this sort of uh, noise spectroscopy happening. Um, just as Reiner was saying, know your enemy. Uh, being able to actually probe your environment and then adapt your error correction to defeat it as, as most efficiently as possible. And there was a talk where you had this uh, anisotropic bake and shore code, which, which showed you could actually get quite far uh, in, in beating that, saving a lot of resource. So. Uh, so I think it's pretty exciting. And uh, the thing I'm, I, I'd be most worried about is whether there would be some jumps in, in, in the physics. So people would discover interesting topological systems and build them artificially that would actually do a lot of the protection for you without a lot of the, the software on top of it doing, trying to do it. But I think I'll hand over. Thanks. There are lots of things that I want. So what I want, first of all, are the things that make fault-tolerant quantum computing work better. I want highly parallelized processing. I want efficient extraction of entropy. I want fast and accurate gates. I want fast and accurate measurements. I want rare qubit leakage. I want non-local couplings between qubits, if you can 
handle that. Uh, I'd like to see experimental evidence that noise is weakly correlated in multi-qubit systems. And incidentally, it would be nice to see a demonstration of quantum error correction really working against naturally occurring noise. That would be good for everyone's morale, I think. Uh, but, you know, Christmas is coming, so what I, what I really, really want um, is really low error rates per gate. Not just below the accuracy threshold, but way below the accuracy threshold. And as long as I'm asking way, way below the accuracy threshold, because the lower, the better, and the less overhead we'll need for fault tolerance. So I'm, I'm, I'm raising a serious question, I hope, which is really far can we go in making gates better? Uh, we've heard a lot at the conference about robust dynamical decoupling uh, methods with clever control protocols with DFSs and the other tricks we know. How, how far can we go in making the performance of our elementary gates uh, better than they are now? And there's something which uh, Jason just mentioned, but which we haven't heard much about at the conference, and that's topological quantum computing and, and the more general theme of whether we can achieve gates that have really, really low error rates because of a clever physical encoding in a system with many degrees of freedom. We don't necessarily have to make the rates so low that we don't have to use error correction, quantum error correction at all, but if we can make error rates much lower, then fault tolerance is going to be easier and it's going to work better. Um, so something I would like to see is a direct demonstration experimentally of non-abelian enion statistics in a uh, many-body system. Not that would be a milestone for quantum condensed matter physics, which it would be, but uh, because it would confirm that quantum codes involving many degrees of freedom really can be realized in nature. We have indirect evidence for topological order now in fractional quantum Hall systems, but I would welcome much more direct evidence. I mean, the reason why do we want to build quantum computers if we're physicists, partly it's to see whether it's possible, right, to see whether nature allows it, and if we um, can find that robust uh, quantum codes can be realized in the lab and in many body systems, uh, that would be a big step forward because even if we're not going to use topological quantum computing in the long run, it would be a, a demonstration, um, settle a nagging point to principle that we can really get big quantum block codes to work and protect quantum information since that seems to be what's going on in these uh, systems with non-abelian topological order. Um, as I said in my talk, I think continuous variable systems like in superconductors and quantum optical systems may have capabilities for protected uh, quantum information processing which go beyond those of qubit systems, of spin systems that we haven't fully learned how to exploit and specifically in the example I gave because Joseph's injunctions have just the right kind of nonlinearity to realize potentially powerful quantum codes in superconducting systems. I want theorists to do things, too. Uh, you know, we have two ideas about how to get an accuracy threshold, concatenated codes and topological codes. How, how about another idea? Um, and by the way, uh, a family of codes doesn't have to have a threshold to, to be interesting and important for quantum computing once error rates are low enough. Families of codes like, like vacant short codes, for example, can be very powerful, even if they don't really formally have a threshold for you know, improving uh, fidelities. Magic state distillation, it's a great, great trick. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Is he still here? Uh, maybe not. Um, but uh, it may, it's kind of made us lazy, you know? So we, if once we do uh, Clifford group computation and, and uh, state installation, we're satisfied. You know, we think we're done. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't exp there are general reasons why we can't do uh, fault tolerance, a universal set of fault tolerant gates transversally, but there are other things we can do uh, to complete a universal set besides magic state distillation, like, like code deformations. I mean, one e example of that, just as an existence proof, is for the, the um, eleven when codes, which realize uh, non-abelian uh, anions just by a sequence of core, uh, code deformations, we can do a universal set of gates, and I'd like to see those ideas develop more. Um, so one more thing to think about. Uh, for theorists in particular, experimental that's very relevant to experiment, what are the things which really go beyond what can be simulated classically that we could do in the relatively near future without using quantum error correction at all, right? The, the reason we're excited about quantum computing is because we want to be able to do things that uh, can't be simulated with classical computers. And, and I don't 
think we're going to be factoring 2,048 digit numbers without quantum error correction, but with a system of order uh, 100 physical qubits without using error correction at all, there may be interesting things we can do that we can argue are uh, beyond what can be simulated classically. And that's something for Reiner to do before he retires, even if he can't keep a qubit alive. And uh, it, would be, it would be exciting, too. I just want to jump in for one second. Sorry? Reiner's not the only show we can do with 300. We, he, can, we, can, we can do quantum simulations with 300 qubits. All right, so think of something you can do with 300 qubits, Scott. <laughs> Good. Wow, that's quite a big Christmas tree. See, in my family, we usually get one present for Christmas. <laughs> so I'll just ask for one. And that is, I'd like to see two qubits demonstrate a universal set of gates with two nines fidelity. If we can get that, we're in business. That's all. <laughs> From the uh, quantum error correction theorists, though, I think we have a lot of work to do. So as a community, realism is not a word we encounter very often, and we need to improve that. We need to improve the realism of our error models, correlated errors. We need really very much to think more about what you can do geometrically. So geometrical constraints are a very under-considered problem because you can't just assume that qubits are magic objects that interact with one another. Um, even when you go to a lot of effort to introduce these things into your technology, there's a cost, either time or fidelity, and it's never perfect. So we really need to take those considerations into account. When you study a code, it should be fault. You know, we shouldn't assume perfect anything. Anything where we sit there and say, oh, let's assume we have perfect, you should stop and not do it. I mean, it's not going to be something that's going to be experimentally relevant. So those would be the two things I would like to see. Realism from quantum error correction, and two qubits with two nines fidelity for an experiment. Two nines. Two nines. Two nines. Four nines. Two nines. Ninety-nine percent. Yes. It's got to be four gates. And it has to be by Christmas. <laughs> so, so just to be clear, it's initialization, measurement, single qubit, and two qubit. Are you talking about 99.99 or 99%? 99%. 99%? Yes. For just two qubits? Just for two qubits in a scalable system. So, so this you is, can make bigger. So this is like the uh, uh, David Haneke paper that where they do uh, arbitrary rotations in SU4, uh, they only get 79% overall fidelity, right? That's, that's kind of what you're after. One system, no where, uh, state preparation, initialization, measurement, everything with 99%. That's right. Okay. Hasn't been done yet, but if it can be done, that to me is a sufficient proof that we can do it. So, uh, <clears throat> in uh, I don't know about Christmas, so I guess I can talk about what's uh, naughty and nice, I guess, uh, in terms of <laughs> what we might think about. The, the first question that uh, Mark put up there is uh, for the theorists is, uh, what do I think that uh, is a quantum error correction idea that's underutilized by experimentalists? And I would say adiabatic quantum computing. The, uh, if you were to tell an outsider that there are four models of quantum computing, and one of them, the circuit model, requires outrageous overhead and demanding hardware requirements. The first question they would ask wouldn't be, well, what can you do to make those requirements better, meet those requirements, and you know, push down the resources? They would say, what about the other models? I think we need to look at these other models more carefully. And of them, the adiabatic quantum computing model, we know it's universal. You can do computation that you can do in the circuit model in the adiabatic model efficiently. Uh, on paper, it looks very robust. Uh, there are arguments to suggest that dephasing might not matter, that you have control robustness because you just have to stay adiabatic. It doesn't matter how much you wander your path. And that energy changing errors are protected by a gap. But in an experiment, there's really only one game in town, and that's D-Wave doing their superconducting uh, quantum computing uh, hardware. There's no reason to believe that superconductors are any more amenable to the adiabatic architecture than any other technology. I think it behooves us to look at the various technologies that are out there and ask whether or not they can realize adiabatic quantum computing or not. I think there's a great potential there to reduce the uh, demands that the circuit model is placing upon us. I think the circuit model has got a bit of a siren song. At first, it seems very nice. Any quantum computation can be decomposed into these elementary parcels of information we call qubits and elementary transformations that we call gates. And so that sets kind of a mandate, mental effort, to work really hard at making these gates very well and these qubits very good. And there's, a, I think, an implicit contract that the theorists have made with the experimentalists that there's a path forward to put these pieces together and do arbitrary things. But the path looks very daunting right now. And I think that we should examine alternative paths. Um, 
I would say that at least in the AMO community, I think they're already realizing this is a very difficult path, and I see many of the experimental, my experimental colleagues looking at uh, analog quantum simulation because they see that the gates are very hard there. Uh, there are folks like Reiner who are still working hard on the digital simulation, but more and more are looking at analog simulation, I think because it's more tractable. And I think a lot of the techniques used in that uh, are amenable to adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, a big open question is the fault tolerance of that model, and I think that uh, we should think carefully about that. How can we combine quantum error correction and the adiabatic model to make things great? I mean, it's sort of like, uh, there used to be these old Reese's commercials in the 70s and 80s, you know, two great things, two great things that taste great together. You know, maybe there's a way to put them together to do something interesting. Uh, in regards to the uh, second question, uh, what uh, would I like to hear from the experimentalists? Uh, I'd like to hear what your scalability challenges are. The experimentalists are very good at telling us what their hardware challenges are. They tell us what the fidelities of their gates are. They tell us how difficult it is to do this and that. I think partly that's because the theorists have conveyed this importance of the threshold to them, and so that they're focusing really good at making, they're focusing many of their efforts on making the uh, individual components very good. And I think that uh, the attitude, prevailing attitude is, well, this scalability concept is just engineering. but. If the theorists are supposed to be providing a path forward, we need to understand what those requirements are so we can uh, come up with proposals that are plausible to move forward. Uh, for example, a uh, requirement that's often overlooked in, I think, all of the theoretical analyses we talked about today is that uh, the, these uh, experiments are controlled by classical electronics, typically, and uh, use wires to control things. And it turns out that wires have thickness, and they run into one another. And if your qubits are very small and your wires are very big and fat, then you're going to have a problem getting the wires to the qubits. This is a kind of issue that, you know, you need to think about if you're going to imagine putting together more and more pieces of this to have a fault-tolerant architecture. So I think that uh, if the experimentalists could convey to us a little bit more about their scalability challenges and not dismiss it as just engineering, and, and the theorists could have an attitude that it's also not just engineering, that they should embrace this, I think that would be helpful. The final question that Mark uh, asked the theorists here, what modifications we think could be made uh, to uh, be more useful. I think uh, the biggest modification isn't one in protocols, but in people. I think that uh, uh, theorists, uh, we need to uh, uh, take an attitude more of service uh, towards the uh, hardware, the exper experimental colleagues. I think there's this, uh, certainly there's communication already between everybody here. Is, there's, this is a great uh, conference where they're between the experimentalists and the theorists. I'm not saying that that's absent. But I think that uh, there's this tendency for the theorists to take a couple of ideas from the experimentalists and hear them, and then the wall goes up and they go off and they do their own thing, and there can, there can be this divergence then from reality uh, for a while after that. And so if there's constant communication and an attitude that the uh, theoretical effort is supporting uh, an experimental effort, uh, I think that there can be a lot more progress. Thank you. Um, all of you, those were, uh, those were great. Uh, I. Uh, I, I think maybe a second round is in order now. Uh, I heard two questions. One was yours, Andrew, about scalability, question of scalability. And the other one was, uh, how good uh, do you actually think you can make your gates? Right? What sort of accuracy do you think you could get to in, in say, next next few years, maybe? Um, so. So who was start down at the end again? Come back before we open it up to the audience. I'll give a general comment to your last comment first, and then I'll give the specifics. I think it's kind of sad that uh, at least some theorists have a perception that experimentalists are trying to sweep scalability under the rug or, or not address it. Uh, no, I, I think it's just being poorly communicated to the theorists. So okay, say. fine. Um, I, I think the challenge is, uh, I'll speak for ions and, and semiconducting dots, because I've done both. but. Uh, uh, I mean, for ions, there are a lot of challenges about how long it takes to move things if you're going to think about the quantum CCD model that Kilpinski wrote about years ago, uh, where you physically transport ions as information carriers because there's no quantum wire in this case. Uh, Chris Monroe and Lu Ming Duan are, are really interested in this transverse mode model where they uh, do local operations using the standard Coulomb interacting gates where there's these motional modes uh, with up to, let's say, 10 ions in one trap. And then they do this kind of uh, interconversion to photons and, and do a, a heralded game uh, for larger scale issues. I think in principle, it's, it's really beautiful. Uh, there are a lot of challenges about what kind of fidelities can be re realized in, in the interconversion and how long does it take to uh, uh, generate an entangled pair or effectively teleport the information using these protocols. And uh, those questions all, almost all relate to 
for Nell losses, reflections from fiber optics, and they're really just nasty things that uh, I've never heard of an, a theorist who wanted to hear anything about it. Uh, I mean, if I, if I start talking, okay, fine. I mean, th these are the kinds of things like when I go to a manufacturer and I say, uh, what kind of ultra-high reflectivity specialty coating for uh, 399 or whatever nanometer light can you give me? And they'll say 99.85% or whatever. And that number goes into some calculation, and it still turns out, you know, it takes 10 to the 6 cycles or whatever the number is in order to ge generate an entangled pair. Really hard, practical questions that have very significant impacts on scalability. And uh, uh, I, I do think there are people working on them. People like Brad Blakestad did this experiment at NIST where they looked at uh, transport of ions through an X-junction, and uh, uh, I think they got eight nines of fidelity in the transport, right? My understanding is they never observed a loss, so yeah, it was yeah, so, unmeasurably low. Right, so I, I was involved in that experiment, and the, the upshot is we, we did it so many times that we could never observe a loss of an ion, right? Uh, it, it's a very practical question that's, I think, uh, to be speaking honestly, not at all sexy, and so it doesn't get the same, same kind of attention as, as when you know, the NIST group did uh, multi-ion Schrodinger cat states and, and things like that. Uh, on the semiconducting side, the challenges all relate to noise in the substrate, right? It's still an unsolved problem, and uh, until we figure out how to make robust two-qubit gates in that technology basis, uh, I know that there's a recent demonstration of qubit gate in the single triplet uh, basis, but it's still, it's a major challenge at the 1Z, 2Z device level uh, before we can really have a clear picture of scalability moving just a minor question, really for everyone. Based on experimental achievements to date, it would appear to me that the shuttling through junctions is far more practical than the optical coupling. Optical coupling seems almost insurmountably difficult by comparison, and it's not clear that it would be better. What advantage would it give? Do you want to answer mine? Or pick up the microphone. Yeah, I picked up the microphone because you uh, spared me. Uh, there's another iron trap group who really thinks about these things. Uh. Sorry. Yeah, no, don't be sorry. I'm here. I can't defend I'll myself. let you speak for yourself. Good. <laughs> I think it's always a bad no, idea when I try uh, to be right. That's fine. Now, the point is, there is other ideas around it. Now, the shuttling oh, idea yes. is definitely viable sure. and uh, certainly is the one that's uh, very well investigated. We do that too in our laboratory. But I personally feel that uh, we have to look for more hybrid technologies here. I'm speaking more for the ions at this time because this, this is my specialty. And we talked over lunch about that. My personal view is rather that we encode logical qubits locally, don't move them, and uh, then have pits of maybe in a, uh, in a surface where you really encode logical qubits. And then you either could just uh, connect, interconnect them by shuttling iron, that's one way of doing it, but that's inherently slow, or dipole, dipole interactions. Yeah, which uh, I, I think, think is very practical, very good. There, there are among practical solutions to that. I think there is a, there is viable ways. But again, we have to think about out of the box and go for other things. Um, I'm a little bit surprised but uh, Andrew's uh, uh, suggestion that uh, we should talk about the intricate details, the gory details of the experiments. Uh, I can do that if you like. Uh, we, we can go on for another two hours and I'll tell you about all the gory details that, that we want to overcome and if you have any solutions to that. I'm not sure that this is, as, as uh, Mike said, this is not very sexy. No, I, I don't mean uh, gory details. Uh, there are even abstract principles that can be drawn when you think about uh, the control, surrounding control apparatus, whether it be electronic or optical or whatnot. Yes, no, let, I, let me give you an example of that. So mm -hmm. the, um, one of the assumptions that was brought up multiple times in the talks was a need for parallelism to do fault-tolerant yes. quantum computing. And there are a number of technologies that have challenges to getting maximal parallelism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there might be a need for multiplexing of one kind or another, whether it's optical or electronic or what have you. And so that means that you can't talk to every qubit at every time step, but maybe every tenth time step or hundredth time step. And that will impact the threshold that you report and the resources that are required to achieve fault tolerance. So an understanding, even at a general sense of what are the kinds of things that could impact something like parallelism is valuable for designers who are trying to come up with yeah, circuits Yeah, but that very much this. depends exactly on the designer, on the architecture, and that's completely different if you do something in semiconductors or in uh, NMR or say uh, with ions or say in, in, in an optical lattice. And uh, so you really have to talk to the individual experimentalists. Absolutely. And then of course then it really is, it's, uh, it's tons of information and this cannot be generalized. So for example, we are, we have problems like uh, in, in amplitude stabilization of the, of the, of the laser. 
and, and things like this, frequency stabilization, things like that. I, I disagree that not, I think there are some things that can be generalized. Certainly the concept of a hot echo or spin echo has been, you know, a pro, you know, dynamical decoupling has been applied to multiple oh, no, technologies where that. pulses sure. are a general concept that are sure. used, whether that pulse is optical, electronic, voltage, whatever, have, you know. That, no, I would agree. This, so there this are can concepts be that are shared, I but believe. But these things are fairly well known. We use, we make con a constant use of these symmetrized pulses of pulse shaping and, uh, and all the, and all the like spin echoes. So this, this is uh, fairly well known, um, but uh, it's, it's more the, things that can also be easily controlled. So, as we said before, we have to know the, uh, the error model of the system, and then we can attack it. It does just takes some time. And my experience is just the opposite of what you were saying. When I'm talking to our theorists in-house, they're not least interested in these things. They're saying, this, I'm not your house theoretician. Uh, I want to do right. the, the theory and not uh, to do the calculations for you guys. Sorry for that. Robert knows exactly what I'm talking about. Right. So my appeal was more to understand general constraints that uh, apply to the extent to which they can be generalized, and if you want to be most valuable to a particular hardware, they would have to be specific. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I have this feeling, and, and I sort of mentioned it before, in that uh, research goes ahead slowly, and then suddenly something happens, and, and a whole new discovery happens, and okay, the theorists can quickly jump and make an advance on that, uh, but if they're all to slave on, on, on the particular uh, nitty-gritty, then sure these jumps would happen, so. It relates to the division of labor I talked about before. Well, People should relates. think about all sorts of different levels of abstraction. And, and, and your best case in the next, say, two years. You mean about the next, uh, next case? Uh, <clears throat> we are trying to improve the technology as much as we can. It depends really on how, how we can overcome the noise sources. Like I said, right now we are developing uh, amplitude stabilizations. Uh, you can stabilize the, the amplitude of the laser down to maybe say 10 to minus 4 if you're really very good. Uh, but that's about it. I think that's the limit as far as I can see it. And then you really would have to make sure that the pulse area is really stabilized. And this is, this is, some, this is technologically very challenging. So what would be really an issue here if we came up with the protocol if that's not so sensitive to the pulse area anymore and things like that. Th things are that insensitive to that, like for instance the rumor separation, uh, the way we did it is now insensitive with respect to the residual motion. We originally worked with the Xerox solar guide operation that was so sensitive to the motion that we could never get beyond say 95% fidelity, nowhere. And uh, now we just do this routinely and things like that that's where you win. This is the physics. The rest is engineering. And, uh, but all of these things have to go hand in hand. It's hard to predict. Then, of course, we would have to uh, set aside a certain amount of measurement time and have to make a very clear protocol uh, how to measure, say, say, four nines. That's not easy at all. And you want to make sure that this is right. At this time, we are, for example, at, uh, we are trying to come up with a standard set for the tomography. When you talk about tomography results and uh, talk about the, the way people derive these results and claim fidelities, you find fidelities for the same amount of data that vary by plus minus 5%, uh, depending on how you define it. And this is just not, just not right. So you have to unify these things and make sure that we speak the same language, do the same measurement procedures. And now we are talking. Uh, about say 99.9% .9 and then we're going to, we're going to go beyond. But let's talk, rather talk about infidelities of 10 to minus 4. That's very hard to measure. You want to be, that this is really precision spectroscopy, precision metrology, and uh, this takes time. It's not at all sexy. People want to see these things being applied to long chains of calculations, computations, uh, and it's very often not very helpful to, to just optimize a single gate. So we'd rather optimize an entire algorithm or say what I call our toolbox. We extend our toolbox to subroutines and the subroutines are checked and they are carefully done and forget it. And then you can concatenate these things l later on. It's a bootstrapping process I, to, uh, to predict how this goes, but I'm sure we can get there. So Just I think for the next three years, we can extend things to 20 qubits. Could I make a comment on that? I mean, we could support that work a lot more. In my opinion, if someone came up with a paper with title, universal set of gates with minimum fidelity, 
That would be something beyond the current state of art. It should get in a very high-ranking journal, and we in this room should support that. And the next six months, when someone comes out with the same title paper, but it's 96 per cent, it'll be a different story as how do they got there. We should also support that as being a very high-quality work. I we shouldn't that, force but this, theorists. But if you, if, you, if you look at that, this is a, it's an enormous amount of work to do this. When I look at the, look at the paper with Stan Bahanica and, uh, and others, and we did the same. We, we can do this. We, can, we, we know that we have a universal set of gates, and if you really want, if you want a particular gate, we can do this. We figure that out and measure it. But it's an enormous amount of work. And uh, I doubt I publish a paper, I got 1% more than, uh, than the other group. Come yeah, on. But why does that happen? Because too many people say it's not valuable work, whereas we should say no. it's extremely it's valuable work. Theorists work. tell me this is incremental work and this is engineering. Yeah. If I talk with the theorists, they tell me, why should I do this? But we shouldn't be saying that. We should be changing the attitude that should be considered a big advance. Yeah, I don't know. I, for us, it's, a, it's a imperative when we want to make progress. Yeah. So this, this goes in, in phases. Right now, we had a very good phase where we just could demonstrate simulations, a few other things. And that was f based on the technological progress that we made over the last three years. Right now, we have another phase where we just boost up the technology again to get to the next phase. But that remains to be seen. This work is in progress. I can't predict how this goes. Because as you say, at the moment, as a community, we force our experimentalists to tell stories, to come up with a new story, to sell a new experiment, not just to focus on the experiment. We, sh we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't need to do that. You know, we should reward good work in a good direction with high-ranking papers. Tell this our funding need. agencies. But they should see we, the papers we, are well-ranked, and that we should might be, be uh, We might be in a loop here. But uh, can I make a different comment? And this compiler that you talk about, I think there is some, yes. there's some general work that can be done there, because uh, it sounds like those things can be engineered once you have the parameters of the of the physics that you're compiling to can be made so it's kind of robust to all sorts of un I think this unknowns. Is a, I personally think the same way, and I, but I couldn't convince our theorists in Innsbruck to, to work on that because they told me this is engineering work. Maybe it is. I talked even to computer scientists uh, in our department and they were not willing to, to step in because they didn't know quantum physics. In the end, the optimization procedure that we have only works if you have a human interface there sitting in front of it hearing this through all the you know uh, the rough waters that you have here uh, so I would really like to have people look into that because I personally think whenever whatever we do when we really uh, start looking into scalar quantum computing simulations and the like we need to come up for every individual implementation uh, for an optimal pulse controller these pulse controllers and NMR and ion traps are actually exactly the same. Different, slightly different frequencies, slightly different things, but otherwise the same. We just need the optimum pulse sequences to do this. Now, we can do that according to NMR, say with amplitude modulation. This is not particularly useful for ions, so we have to do this slightly different. But the underlying principles are the same. I would like someone to look into that. Okay, thanks. So, so because, very quickly, there was some commentary about what kinds of gate, uh, gate fidelities we can achieve and, and what kind of problems relate to that, and it was specifically questioning uh, about the challenges. It's, it's really important to keep in mind that when we're talking about pushing even single qubit gate fidelities to the 10 to the minus 5 gate infidelities to the 10 to the minus 5 level, not only are we talking about the state of the art in quantum computing, we're talking about the state of the art in commercial hardware. I mean, you're, you're talking about extraordinarily no, low phase noise on a master oscillator. If you want a gate infidelity over some period, some number of cycles in your pulse, that is at the 10 to the minus 5 level or below. I mean, sure, this but is, I only want two nines, not five. I, I understand, but I many want other five. people want, John wants one. <laughs> I mean, no, so there, I mean, look, the, John, John brought up explicitly before, let's get the gate errors not just low, but as low as we can possibly go. And it's, I mean, I'm totally on board with that, but it's, uh, it's there's a lot of, classical electrical engineering, I mean, the kind of box you need from Agilin in terms of, uh, of phase noise stability is $100 just to get to the 10 to the minus 6 level uh, in, in theory, in principle, right? So this is a really hard problem. Which depends, of course, a lot on the system. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk to me, I'll be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the phase noise, say, at 260 gigahertz is, of course, a lot more expensive than, say, at 100 megahertz. Sure, something. absolutely. 
Uh, I, I would like to say a few words about the scalability issue. Uh, and I mean, you want it from us to know where we see potential, I guess, or where we see hurdles. And one thing I've always missed in the context of liquid state NMR, liquid state NMR was always uh, said it's not scalable because it doesn't have pure states. But I mean, there's been a lot of work demonstrating that you don't need pure states. And there have been some algorithms which work with mixed states and uh, some like the DQC1 model where you need one pure qubit and the rest is mixed one. And, but still, most of the algorithms which have been published were geared towards pure state quantum computation. And so I think there would be a lot of potential in that direction. Still, I mean, with liquid state MR, you won't get to 100 qubits. That's, but maybe you could get 20 qubits, and uh, that's certainly not impossible if you're willing to deal with mixed states. Uh, similar, uh, if you look at uh, diamond and V centers, you, there you could work with uh, pure states, uh, and you could probably have quite a few qubits if you're willing uh, to have a complicated network. And I mean, assuming you have a random uh, doping or random positioning of centers because engineering cannot provide us with, equally, with equal distance and these centers. But what they can do, well, uh, the, the people, I want 50 and these centers within, say, 20 nanometers, and they'll do that. The problem is we then first have to completely characterize the system and adapt all the algorithms to the specific coupling network and uh, orientation of the axis and so on. I mean, if that's something you can do, adapt the algorithms to a pre-existing system where we it will be a lot of work to tell you the Hamiltonian, but eventually we could do that. If you can then uh, adapt the algorithm to such a system, that would be great. Yeah, I get the impression that uh, a lot of uh, experimental groups are maybe hesitant to uh, look too carefully into this scalability question for fear that it might look worse than they might want it to seem. You know, and there's this sort of this hope that down the road there'll be uh, you know, some solution to these ring type problems. Uh, just like Reiner says to them, the theorists say, oh, that's just engineering. I think some of the experimentalists say, oh, I don't want to be an engineer. I want to just do my great science on a small scale. And um, uh, I think nobody wants to end up, you know, in the graveyard of NMR uh, that, uh, you know, if suddenly, you know, there was this report, this 2004, there was this um, roadmap, right, for quantum information processing. And uh, scalability from the DiVincenzo criteria is one of the metrics. And I think, you know, if you had a red dot on that chart, that wasn't very good. And so I think that uh, there's some concern about that. Of course, the, so I, I'm asking for a bit more openness, I guess, about the scalability challenges uh, to see what can be addressed there. I think uh, Manny Nill, actually, uh, who's in the audience here, did a great service to the community by pointing out that it's not all just threshold. His high threshold results, I don't see it. His paper, the way I read it, is not as a way to say, here's a way to get a very high threshold. It was, here's a message to you in the community. It's not all about threshold. There's more going on than just the threshold. I thought that was a, a very important, and uh, I think we're starting to, starting to sink in more and more as we're seeing in the talks here in this conference. So uh, I think it just behooves us to think carefully about what are the challenges. Uh, and to the extent to which they can be generalized across the technologies, uh, a theorist who isn't just a house theorist might be able to address those. Uh, there might have been a time in the past where we thought that pulses were great just for NMR if you wanted to make, you know, do better, you know, resonance kind of experiments. It wasn't until many years later that we saw oh, there's general principles involved here that we can apply to other technologies. So it's an appeal, a Christmas appeal. Jason, you have another oh, no. comment or? Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, in the first round, everyone made great comments, and they all did it being much less obnoxious than I was. <laughs> uh, and there was a lot of good advice, like uh, we should learn one another's language, we should avoid infinities. But the best advice was from uh, Mike, who said theorists should be more like Manny. And I, I, I mean, I'd do that if I could. Um, so one other uh, thing that came up in, in Andrew's uh, comments is the distinction between digital and uh, analog uh, quantum simulation, which was mentioned in Reiner's talk. 
And so here I am again uh, coming back to uh, what can we do without quantum error correction. But, um, you know, in the near term, if we want to reach uh, what we might call quantum supremacy, uh, doing things uh, in the lab that can't be done or can't be simulated classically, one approach to doing that is analog quantum simulation. Uh, and it's a very active field, you know, in, with lots of different systems called ultra-cold atoms, molecules. People are trying to do it with superconductors and with ions. Um, and, uh, but there are interesting questions there about can one, given the limited control of those systems, obtain answers to computational problems which really are hard to simulate? Uh, given that the systems are noisy, that you don't know exactly what the Hamiltonian is. So the hope is, I mean, people in the field realize that's what they're trying to do. They want to do something that you can't just simulate on a digital computer. Um, so on the other hand, since you don't really know exactly what the system is that uh, you're simulating in the lab with great precision, you want to study robust properties which aren't that sensitive to deformations of the Hamiltonian. And how hard are those is, is part of the question. And, uh, you know, um, we, we sort of have this prejudice, um, I mean, it's more than a prejudice, I mean, it's a well-founded one that a quantum in which we um, can't do quantum error correction is not a powerful one, that you can't do things that we can't do classically. Um, but, um, you know, as a matter of principle, if, if, as long as we have some way of getting entropy out, then in principle we could still do things that are hard to simulate. And, you know, we, we as a community, I think, should try to uh, give sharper answers to the question, how hard are the things that people are trying to observe or achieve with analog quantum simulators? May, may I just comment on this? I really support that point of view very much so, because uh, very often uh, quantum computers in the, the public, are especially also by our phys with our phys physics colleagues, are conceived as something universal, and if it doesn't do number crunching, it's not a quantum computer. So we have done a lot of analog uh, quantum simulations for that very reason, just to explore things where we can go better, that or we actually can make things differently than you would actually do uh, in a classical uh, computer. So I really would recommend that we explore these things much more, and that we convey the idea that, as you call it, that we can get the quantum supremacy uh, very soon both ways, and even without the full launch of uh, quantum error correction. So I think we should really get this to a broader, uh, on a broader basis. And my personal point of view, may, if I may add to that, is that the, the real applications of this is not going to be in the long range, or uh, as I say, in the, in the midterm, in midterm range, it's not so much number crunching and simulations, but it's also metrology. Because what we are doing, we are trying to enhance metrology with quantum methods. And this can be achieved with few a few qubits, either digitally or in an analog analogous way. And I think that here uh, is probably a, a, a resource that we still have to open. Because if you just look back, most, most computers are not used for number crunching and large scale computations. Uh, nowadays, almost every dishwasher mm -hmm. has uh, a microcomputer, microchip built in, uh, which was 30 years ago just a computer. Everybody would have been proud to have it. So we can possibly enhance every measurement, every measuring device with quantum methods that use these things, and uh, that's something we should really convey. I don't think that the quantum error correction, which is, can be built in, but it's not a, a necessary ingredient to get to that quantum supremacy. So can, I, can I add on to that very quickly? Uh, there's a flip side to that argument. Uh, which ties into something that Austin was saying before that I feel very strongly about, which is not only can these quantum effects and, and uh, informatic techniques be useful for metrology, but metrological research is extraordinarily useful in quantum information. And so uh, to get, to get uh, this uh, uh, cultural discussion we were having before about what kind of work gets supported, uh, I, I strongly believe that if you want this field to succeed and really make serious progress, when there is an open hire in your department, you should not just support the guy who does quantum information. You should support pre precision metrologists. Uh, I mean, everything we do depends on ultra-high stability lasers, as Reiner was talking about, or RF sources, 
like Dinner was talking about, and if you look at the bag of tricks that's in use today, it's NMR, which is spectroscopy, and it's atomic clock work, right, which is spectroscopy and, and laser spectroscopy and the like. So please support precision metrology to advance quantum information and vice versa. Okay. I, I, uh, I did want to leave some time. We have about 20 minutes left or so. I wanted to leave some time for some questions for the audience. So you guys interjected, so I'm sorry. I'm no, no, a little bit please. <laughs> okay. And yes, thank you, Jason. So thank all of you. Uh, but now let's, let's see who. So uh, Andrew brought up this uh, question of adiabatic quantum computing, which uh, was promptly ignored by uh, all the experimentalists. No, no, so no, I, want, I want to force it back uh, on the yeah, table, uh, if basis. you don't mind. Uh, could you address it, please? You want to, <laughs> <laughs> you want to address it? Go they ahead. all want to go first. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that we did a lot of, well, not, I mean, we did quite a bit of adiabatic quantum computing. For instance, uh, I mean, you know, if, I guess everybody knows, knows that Shor's algorithm was implemented on 15. Well, we did a factoring algorithm on 21, adiabatically. <coughs> uh, we did uh, adiabatic quantum computing for quantum phase transitions, a uh, lot of other things. But, I mean, it's, of course, that was done in NMR. And uh, of, it's so, sort of indirect because we use, I mean, we normally consider an MR as a uh, network model, but you can, of course, use the network model to simulate adiabatic quantum computing. So I think there's a, fu there's a funny asymmetry that I think is developing in the community about adiabatic quantum computing that uh, people push very hard on, on demanding what kind of fault tolerance and scalability you can realize if you're an experimentalist doing gate model. But hard questions like that are not generally asked about adiabatic quantum computing or even topological quantum computing. When we, if topological quantum computing works, well, first of all, it's beautiful physics, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but what new problems come into play and thought of? Uh, there's this, this deep dive, really hard, uh, critical look on the scalability of uh, transporting trapped ions for, for quantum algorithms, but we, we brush similar issues aside in, in AQC, and, and you know, Andrew, you made a comment before about D-Wave being the only game in town. I mean, D-Wave has written a paper in which they said, we can never realize uh, using our approach the kind of scale-ups that give equivalence between adiabatic quantum computing and uh, the circuit model. Uh, so it certainly is a useful approach, and they do all sorts of very interesting physics work that has lots of utility, but I think we're not, we're not approaching the two problems in the same way at this point. If I may, I think maybe part of the reticence of experimental groups to get engaged in uh, adiabatic quantum computing is that there's this ongoing war uh, about the, uh, com the computational power of, of adiabatic quantum computers to solve optimization problems. And there's this back and forth of, you know, can they solve it or not? But uh, that's a, actually a sideshow, I believe. I believe the, the, the real question is, you know, universal quantum computing in the adiabatic model. D-Wave's computer does not do that. And I think uh, you, need a you need a sufficiently rich repertoire of interactions to be able to achieve that. Um, we need to have like a DiVincenzo criteria for the adiabatic model that says, you know, if you have this uh, set of interactions and, you know, this kind of layout and whatnot, then you can achieve universal quantum computing. And then that might set a target that experimentalists could look at and say, well, I have this interaction, dipole interaction, can I do it? Oh, I have an exchange interaction, can I do that? You know, they can look and see what they have and what kind of layout considerations that they have. Um, so I think, uh, I think we shouldn't get distracted by this question of optimization and, and uh, what D-Wave's machine is doing. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis universal quantum computing. We should be looking at other experimental systems and asking, can they realize universal quantum computing? And in particular, are these theoretical promises of robustness borne out in the laboratory? Uh, you know, paper to say, oh, there's a gap. It protects you from noise. And oh, we've got control robustness. And certainly, experimentalists are aware of the value of doing things adiabatically. I mean, even in the gate model, certain gates are done adiabatically. Some of the processes, you know, adiabatic transport has a very long and rich history. Uh, I think. Uh, it's a valuable idea, and I think we should start thinking about, well, maybe we can process quantum information adiabatically in a universal way, and uh, let's think seriously about what kind of hardware requirements are needed to do that. 
Actually, I, I have a comment on that. I'm, I mean, you, you mentioned that it's adiabatic pulses or gates are used in network model, for instance, and I really see this as not as uh, this, uh, well, separate models. We can really implement both in the same uh, compute, in the same com processor, same computer, and we do some things adiabatically, others we do with pulses, with non-adiabatic pulses, and for some, one works better for the uh, others, other work. I mean, there's been a, said a lot that adiabatic is l uh, less prone to errors, but I don't think anybody has ever proved that. And I mean, I think that depends a lot on what you're actually trying to achieve. For some things, it's definitely fault, fault tolerant, more fault, fault tolerant than gates, but for others, it's definitely not the case, and I don't think, at least I've not seen a general rule which says that one or the other is better. Uh, but I would also like to comment on your other remark that uh, the systems have to be universal. And I must say, I don't really care. What, what I care is that I can implement a specific uh, algorithm, for instance. That I, I can solve a specific problem. And for instance, uh, when we discuss what Reiner also mentioned, that he would like to do quantum simulations. For quantum simulations, you need general purpose quantum computer. And I think at the moment we're really not in a stage that we need general purpose computers. I think what we need is computers which uh, can solve specific problems, and that's what we're most experimentalists are working on. I mean, of course, the long-term goal would be to have a general purpose computer, but that's at least 2033. Okay, so just two brief responses to that, and I know Mark wants to throw it out to the audience again. So uh, with regard to your first comment, uh, I completely agree that the, uh, uh, there isn't a, a clear answer about the robustness of adiabatic quantum computing, and uh, it, quantum information is an experimental science, and I think it needs to be addressed experimentally, and I, I would encourage my experimental colleagues to investigate this to see whether or not it's true or not. And with regards to universal uh, quantum computing, okay, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I was getting a little bit like John, you know, wanting it all, uh, so I think for, you know, universal quantum computing, but, we'll, but there is room. There's, there's, there's room in the middle, you know, to do interesting things. Uh, metrology is a, an interesting example, simulation at a small scale. There are all kinds of things you can imagine doing at a small scale. Um, uh, I just think that the adiabatic approach is something that hasn't been explored sufficiently well experimentally yet. So, so, uh, so your task is to write one of these Di, Di Vincenzo type lists, right, Andrew? Right. Mark. Okay, well, um, as someone whose actual job it is to put programs together that push this, the science forward, I, I want to ask the, the, the following question. I heard uh, the experimentalists lament the issue of not having certain types of good design tools or having people who could operate those design tools. And um, so I'd like to understand what design tools are needed and then like what, um, the, what the theorists think they could, is there a needed version of some sort of a quantum version of VHDL or Verilog? Is there some sort of a quantum spice that needs to come into existence? What could be put into that? What could the, what, what could the theorists could donate to that? And what would, the, what would the experiments like to have to go forward? Are there, a, are there, is there some sort of a standard um, gate set? I mean, that, maybe, that's too, maybe that's too looking too, too far into the future, but what are the pieces that have to, uh, what are the tools that have to come into existence to, to, to make things go forward, and to, particularly to go forward faster, I think. Uh, it takes a long time. I think everyone heard the lament that it's, the theorist gets an idea very quickly, and then it takes quite a while to put that into, into practice. And I don't think that has to be that way, but I think we have to build some tools around it, so I want to hear more about that. And I, I'd open this up to the entire audience. If you, you know, contact me, this is a, this is a, this looks like a potential program to me. Thank you. So maybe Can I just comment on this. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, the, this is all started a few years ago with trap foundries, some electronic circuits we've done within uh, the IARPA approaches and things like that. Yes, I understand that. That's why I'm referring to it. And uh, we are at this time we are developing in one of these programs a TIQC spice. So this is a sort of a spice equivalent for trapped ion quantum computing. 
because th we feel that is necessary. That is based on a program that we developed years ago in Innsbruck and uh, which is now run in four or five different nodes. But what I would suggest is something that we really need now, for, at least for our implementation, but I'm sure this will come for later for other implementations too, later on. Because we have this uh, multitude of gate operations available, so that we don't have a uniquely defined sequence of things. We need an optimizing compiler that seriously tackles this and just gives us an optimum program. Because we can run these sequences within our available coherence time that we experimentally really extend all the time. Every year we make some progress. But it really is a go or no go if you just have the right program. And ten years ago when we made the first teleportation experiment that went only was only successful because we were able to sort of hand optimize the algorithm, the pulse sequence. And this is not so complicated with simulation pulses of about 140 gate operations, uh, 150. We, can't, we simply can't do this anymore. And that's why I personally find this is missing. This is one thing. I don't think that needs a huge program. We just need to find someone or a few people who really tackle that problem. But that's now my personal point of view. So, I mean, in NMR, they've got the, a lot of these tools already built, but they're not very usable by the larger community. So there's this grape algorithm, and, and you can derive all sorts of robust pulse sequences, but it, it, it's like, as Reiner says, you have to have someone there taking all the constraints and all the particular physical parameters that, uh, what, you can, what control Hamiltonians are available to you, what, what uh, uh, powers that, that you can have on, on certain time, time scales, and, and feed it in and, and get an answer out. So up until now, I haven't really seen a general tool available. Well, I mean, not a general tool, not in the sense of a universal compiler for that, but of course, uh, there is a scientific field in the background, which is optimal control theory. And that relates, uh, I mean, that's what people use. That's the basis for the great algorithm and all the other techniques which are used in magnetic resonance and in laser spectroscopy, by the way, also. Yeah, it's very, very developed. The point simply is it has to be adapted for the various needs, and it's very closely related. That's the reason why serious theorit theoreticians think they don't want to get into that because it's all known. They want to do their own things, but you nevertheless have to do it. Yeah. And I don't feel as an experimentalist uh, able to, to do this. We've done this nevertheless, but this is certainly the first try, it needs some serious effort here. Uh, but maybe we can continue a bit on, because I think there is not a single answer to your question. There are dozens, and basically every implementation has its own uh, needs. Uh, in the semiconductor community, of course, a lot of that is present already from microelectronics industry. Uh, the semi well, but at least that they rely on the existing uh, foundry basis and so on. They, they I mean, sure, to, to actually get it going, they have to advance, the, but they, they can build on an excellent basis, which we don't have, for instance, in but time. They're, they're doing the same thing. John Martinez and Rob Shirkov, they are using now parts of our programs, same, same way. They have the same yeah, no, I was talking about the hardware, not about the oh, software. The hardware, okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the software. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There are different aspects. Yeah. Uh, there's hardware, there is software, and the f hardware is different for every, uh, for every system, like in the diamond. There are people now developing imp implantation schemes where they can deposit uh, ions, nitrogen ions, with a precision of a few nanometers. Uh, but these are small efforts distributed around the globe. Uh, and, and again, it's a completely different issue. I mean, that, has, that requires input actually from iron storage people and uh, also from people in material science, uh, from electronics and so on. And, and if you go to semiconductors or superconductors, again, it's a completely different technology basis in each case. From my perspective, the, the semiconductor people have the best basis to build on, but of course, for instance, the, the people doing superconductors, they, to some degree, rely on the same. I mean, they're using the same lithographic tools, for instance. Well, it might not only be in the terms of lithographic tools, you know. Yeah. 
it's almost think, the tools think what's in spice where you have LC resonators now you got to make them quantum you have to start asking questions perhaps about uh, tolerances and how do how do the tolerances that you have then translate back into the error models can you do that at a design level um, and so those that's those are the questions I'm asking and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing great silence from the theoretic from the theorist side so maybe they view these problems as all solvable or solve problems they don't really want to solve. Uh, actually, I was trying to think who I could talk to to get people on. The, I have a few names in mind of students in the past that I've worked with on these kinds of problems. But first, I need to be convinced they really can do better than you. As someone that's not an expert in my lab, my initial feeling is, can we really do better than you guys can do already? But I'd certainly like to help if we can. And uh, for me, I mean, we have done grape and NV and things like that. It took a lot of work to understand what actually is happening in the NV and what the controls were possible, but uh, it seemed to work. Uh, but it was a very tailored solution, uh, lots of effort, and it would be great to have a more widely distributed uh, software package to be able to do that. So possibly running closed loop with the experiment? So on the, on the SPICE issue, I just wanted to emphasize how uh, uh, one of the big challenges we face is how different, uh, even small variations in implementation uh, can be. So people may look at me and Reiner and, well, we're clearly distinguishable uh, by talent. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Reiner uses calcium ions. He uses an optical transition. I favor a beryllium ion, which has either a hyperfine or a spin flip transition. The frequencies are totally different. The capabilities are very different. And even when it comes to two qubit gates, if you're talking about Mulmer Sorensen versus a geometric phase gate, uh, it's very, it's just very challenging to build a single model that addresses even the challenges of ion trapping. Right? There's so much variation. Uh, the place where I do think there's a huge amount of opportunity is in taking the however many decades of control theory research and translating it in some way, you know, if we have the Rosetta Stone, the person who can do both, uh, into language that we use in environments, that's extraordinarily useful. It's, I mean, Hideo is a person who's like that, uh, uh, Andrew Doherty is a person who's like that, I mean, but everybody has lots and lots of interests and they span many body physics and all these things and it's, uh, of course, challenging to tell anybody to do any one thing, but uh, that, that's an area where I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity if we have a better tool set of translation of existing known concepts into what we actually do. You're fairly satisfied with that? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> then maybe we should continue. Are there any uh, other questions? Maybe one more question, if we can. Then, uh, before we get to uh, okay. Last one. So this is a question for the experimentalists. Um, so it's a question about overhead. So suppose we work on overhead in these fault tolerant models. What could we be aiming for other than as low as possible? And in particular, uh, to uh, looking forward, do you think you'd be willing to create higher fidelity gates for better overhead? This is a very tricky and very hard question. It very much depends on what you really want to do. When we are talking about the computer architecture, then all of that overhead you're talking about depends on how this is laid out. Uh, someone mentioned already the wiring. Someone mentioned already how the scalability issues in ions, I know this, and, 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 and uh, likewise in uh, superconducting qubits. <coughs> That is an enormous overhead, and it depends very much on how you do the layout of the system, how you just make these things. So f let me give you an example. If you really want to do uh, a real scalable iron chip, for example, then uh, it would be nice to have uh, uh, most of the overhead added underneath the chip, optically, electronically, that really done on board. That would be a nice vision. That could relieve you of very many things, so it's, it's a sort of a trade-off. Once that overhead is taken care of, small scale, then you can just add, add more particles. It very much depends on what you want to do. Do we want to have uh, a supercomputer and number crunching device? Yes, then you really have to start thinking about a, a real architecture. For the time being, 
you're talking, at least in my laboratory, not about 300 qubits, sorry, I'm not there yet. Uh, we're talking about maybe 20, and uh, maybe in five years about 40 qubits. And for that, the overhead is manage manageable. So I'm rather trying here to manage the 40 qubits and not so much think about a complicated, or say a more economic architecture. And we as experimentalists, at least in my lab, don't have the time right now to really think about some deep, how to scale this up to large scale systems. Ike Chuang does that, and he has uh, investigated these things quite a bit. So we are collaborating, and uh, he is also uh, working right now on the TIQC SPICE, uh, just to, to come back to the, your, your question, which I personally think is a, is a nice tool with which we can start thinking in that direction, and to see what kind of specifications are needed on the hardware side, depending on what we need when we, when we scale things up. But uh, I cannot really generally answer that question, because we don't have a unified setup not even for ions, and they are really vastly different. We have big traps, we have small traps, we have segmented traps, we have planar traps. You know, there's no decision, and the, the infrastructure and the overhead depends even on the implementation there, and more so if you're now talking about superconducting qubits or in V centers or atom, atomic lattices. So it's very hard. Uh, actually, maybe I can clarify the question a bit. So mostly I was asking uh, overhead involved in fault-tolerant protocols. So theoretically, <clears throat> obviously that's quite high, and the question is, if we can bring that down, could we be aiming mostly to bring it down with, uh, say, still very high, rel relatively high error rates, or is it worth uh, the trade-off of, of lower error rates but lower overhead from fault tolerance? Again, that depends on the implementation. If it's easier for you, if qubits are cheap, for example, right. in a solid state device, qubits are, uh, are cheap, and you can just manage to get around all the coherence issues, that's fine. Then you can trade off more qubits. For ions, qubits are never cheap. In optical lattices, qubits are cheap. So it's, it really very much depends on the overhead, and, and on the, sorry, on the implementation, what kind of overhead you had. So I would rather not do a two-step uh, two uh, error correction with ions. That would be encoding, say, uh, a logical qubit into 49 ions. That would be a nightmare. Can I just make a comment? Even though I think qubits might be cheap, I think the control is expensive. And, and so even though there might be, uh, if you want to have individual addressable control and you scale it up to huge numbers of qubits, it'll get gets just too costly. So this is going back to my, my comments about global control. If, if people can do global control, that can reduce a lot of the addressing and the technical, tech, technical overhead and, and do it dealing with this uh, concatenation overhead. I was going to say more or less the same. I mean, when I heard about these 49, what, whatever, one nine codes or something, I thought yeah, people were joking. <laughs> I mean, we, we would be happy to, uh, actually, we, we have, a, we're working on a five and seven uh, qubit code right now, and it's hard, but it's working. But I see absolutely no hope for 49 qu uh, physical qubits in the near future. So I have an order of magnitude better gate on a seven qubit system. If that, if that the numbers, if that, these are the numbers that you're thinking of. Well, I mean, there's, I, unfortunately for uh, small systems, there's very limited options. Um, there's just not that many codes available. Uh, more, I'm thinking in the, in the long term as we scale up, and suppose you do have hundreds or thousands of qubits, would you rather be spending those qubits, you know, 100 to 1, with you know relatively high error rates, or ten to one, or five to one, or maybe even two to one, you know, with with uh, lower error rates. Well, the future is hard to predict, and yeah, I think sure. that Reiner said it already. It depends on the implementation. That's impossible to, to say right now. I'll go in on a little more. <laughs> say something. Okay. Uh, I'll just say I think it's more likely that we're going to see continued advances on the than on the how many things can you pack into unit space side. I mean, you've run into some fundamental limits if you're talking about how much classical control circuitry you can put underneath an ion trap. And uh, I think those fundamental limits are closer than whatever limits we'd face on, I don't know, laser amplitude stability or phase noise or anything like that. Okay, um, I guess we're a bit over time. Uh, but we should definitely thank the panelists.
And there's a poster session upstairs tonight again. Any other announcements?